Okay. Ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, if everyone would take a seat, then we can start our workshop. Because we're live streaming this event, and I prefer to also start with the substance. So if you could all please have a sit, take your seats so we can start. Translation is available in Spanish, German, French, and English. So feel free to take a device. I think we have a, a, a video that we can uh, start. Climate change is no longer a distant threat. It's here and now, impacting the lives and livelihoods of all Europeans. Our changing climate is causing more extreme weather events in Europe. Record floods, devastating forest fires, Prolonged and increasingly intense heat waves and droughts have become disturbingly common. Science predicts that these events are said to become more regular and dramatic in the years to come. Extreme weather events come at a very high cost, both in terms of human lives and economic losses. These costs exacerbate existing regional and social inequalities, hitting lower income communities the hardest. To address this crisis, we must take two essential steps. First, we must continue our efforts to tackle the root cause of climate change by reducing greenhouse gas emissions. This is crucial for the long-term health of our planet. Second, we must develop a new set of adaptation policies with a just transition at their core. Vulnerable citizens should not bear the brunt of climate change impacts. They are the least responsible for greenhouse gas emissions, yet they suffer the most. that vulnerable citizens do not pay twice, we as socialists and democrats advocate for a new approach to adaptation, making our infrastructures and our communities much more resilient and rethinking our very notion of social protection to transit towards a new form of social ecological protection. To this effect, the EU must develop a new policy framework for adaptation policy that will be powerful enough to live up to the increasingly disruptive impacts of climate change. Uh, because it's 
live streamed. Uh, welcome all to the workshop on adaptation presented to you by the SND Group. I'm Mohammed Shaheem, Vice President of the SND Group. I would say mainly responsible for the European Green Deal. Um, and before we start with a very interesting panel, I would want to welcome Irache, our President in the European Parliament of the SND Group, my Khefa, to come to give us some opening words on, on, on adaptation. Irache, please. Thank you, Mohamed, my dear Vice President. <laughs> eh, muchas gracias, amigos. Well, thank you very much, dear friends, for being here this morning. Anis, maybe some of you will need the translation, but as you can understand. The English interpretation is on Channel 2, so anyone who is on Channel 2 will be able to hear me. Which? Muchas gracias, amigos. So, thank you very much, dear friends for your presence here today. We've reached a time in history at which we need to really look at what we're doing and the consequences of what we're doing for the medium term. Via ignorance, we may well cause irreparable damage to the planet on which our well-being and futures depend. Now, the words that I've just spoken aren't mine. These uh, from the Earth Summit in Stockholm. And this was the first time that people became aware of a threat that has now become existential, and we've seen that with the disasters that we've seen that have resulted from climate change. I think the video was very clear on that. Half a century after the Stockholm Earth Summit, these words are still topical, and they still require us to act. The Stockholm Declaration talked about ignorance or indifference. How can you be indifference, indifferent excuse me, to the cry of desperation from peoples who live on the Pacific? For example, Acapulco. We've had devastating fires, torrential rains, floods, and more on both sides of the Mediterranean. You can't be indifferent to all the millions of people who are displaced in Asia and Africa who are fleeing the climate disaster. July was the hottest July ever recorded on Earth. The average temperature was extremely high, far above the limit that uh, we were hoping to see by the end of the century. Now, we're here in Malaga, in the Mediterranean, and the Mediterranean is one of the regions of the Earth that, Earth that has seen one of the highest increases in temperature, which makes it one of the areas that is most affected by the lack of achievements in terms of reducing greenhouse gases. Last summer, we had various heat waves, and nine million people suffered some kind of restriction in terms of their water use in three months of drought. In addition, the glaciers in the Pyrenees and also some Spanish lakes are suffering from the extreme weather conditions. But science provides us with increasing numbers of warnings that the damage caused by climate change will have a serious effect on current and future generations. But in spite of that, Vox and the People's Party deny the effects of climate change in the local authorities and autonomous regions where they govern, they slow down the establishment of low emissions emission zones, they reject EU climate policies, and they ignore the fact that the price of not acting to prevent climate change is greater than the cost of fighting it. The European Environment Agency estimates that the cost has been 500 billion since 1980, and it has a serious impact in sectors such as tourism, agriculture, cultural heritage, infrastructure, etc. But it's also painful in terms of lives. In the summer of 2022, almost 62,000 people died in Europe as a result of the high temperatures, and every year 
over 300 million, a uh, thousand, excuse me, Europeans die prematurely because of air pollution. And given that, the European Union cannot be indifferent and the Social Democrat group cannot be indifferent either because indifference will not make us immune to the devastation caused by climate change. Our societies require a response. But this is also an issue of historic justice. Europe led the Industrial Revolution and the fossil fuel era. And given that, it has to be Europe that leads decarbonisation and a new era of sustainable energies. And for that reason, from our political family, we demanded of the de la, von der Leyen Commission in 2019 the implement the uh, establishment of the Green Deal. We need to reform the electricity market and reform, uh, reduce, excuse me, electricity prices. And that's something else that our group has achieved. And also, we have to say congratulations today, because yesterday the Nature Restoration Law Trialogues concluded. And that's been another flagship issue for our political family. And I think we've shown that things can be done better than they have been in the past. And it's thanks to the work of this political group, our rapporteur Cesar. I don't know if he's here because he was negotiating last night and I don't know if he had time to get here. But uh, Teresa, who was leading the Spanish delegation, she, uh, Spanish Council delegation, she worked hard as well. Uh, and also our dear Vice President of the Commission, Mara Sefcevic, as well. They were all negotiating last night and they've achieved this wonderful result. We've also been negotiating the Fit for 55 package, nature restoration law, we mentioned that. There's also the air quality law, which uh, achieved agreement in co-repair. And these are major and symbolic issues. They're two directives. But in addition, we have conservative governments that are accepting and negotiating these governments. But we also have a uh, right-wing group in the European Parliament, the EPP, which is trying to destroy all these achievements and trying to torpedo the negotiations. This is all electoral politics. The centre-right is uh, having uh, various political disputes with the far-right, and the centre-right is trying to get win votes by falsely defending farmers and rural communities. And they've even resorted to lies to call into question scientific evidence and but they've become climate deniers. 3,500 scientists and large businesses were in favour of the nature restoration law but the EPP nevertheless declared war on it in spite of the fact that it was necessary to repair our natural habitats and to ensure food security. It's also, it was also necessary to consolidate the growth of businesses. This was a law that was urgent in order to prevent and mitigate the impacts of climate change. I mean, the law aimed to keep the planet one that was hab habitable for future generations. And that's what we're here for in politics. We're here to work hard and to guarantee not only the present, but the future for future generations, our sons and our daughters, who need a planet on which they can live. Dear friends, today the European Union has a consistent framework to achieve climate neutrality by the year 2050. I talked about climate denial, but uh, in our political family we're going for uh, the electrification of transport, more energy efficiency, and many other measures that are going to lead to a fair energy transition. We can't decarbonize, for example, without thinking about people, about their concerns and about their futures. The environmental transition needs to be a tool to fight inequality and an opportunity for change that will link digitalization, innovation, and decent jobs. Because if there's one thing we've learned from globalization, it's that you can't have winners and losers. If you've got losers, at the end of the day, it's all of us who lose. We need to ensure climate neutrality by 2050 with social justice. But in order to do that, we need courage. We need a new level of multilateral negotiations. We need cooperation between countries because we know that 
developing countries are those that have contributed least to climate change, but they're the ones who suffer most of the consequences. We need to improve financing for the adaptation of these countries. That is a clear commitment that we need to take. In July, the Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, said that the era of global warming has concluded. It's now the era of global boiling as it were, and I think his words relate, relate to the fact that the planet needs to deal with higher temperatures now. So there is uncertainty there, but there can't be uncertainty with regard to our response. The next conference of the parties in Dubai needs to come up with clear commitments so that we can stick to the Paris commitments, because our lives are at stake here, and the only alternative that we have available is the one that we're fighting for so that we can guarantee our futures. Now, we're often told that we need to be climate change activists. The Stockholm Declaration talked about ignorance and indifference. This is something we're still seeing from the center right and the far right. But in spite of all of that, we need to be more active and more ambitious. Dear friends, the fight against climate change requires courage and determination. We also need to show leadership and solidarity. But above all, we need to move from words to actions. So let's get on with it. Thank you. Thank you. OK, thank you. Thank you, Irachi, for your inspiring words. Uh, and now we continue with the workshop. I, I'm going to introduce I don't think any of you need any introduction, but I will try a little bit. First of all, we have Teresa Rivera, Vice President of the Spanish Government and as Minister Responsible for Ecological Transition and Demographic Challenge. Uh, and I know that you're a real champion when it comes to the social climate and energy policies. And as the President of the European Council, you're doing really good work, like finalizing the well-needed, the much-needed nature restoration law. Teresa, please. And second, we have Maros Sefcovic. I would summarize him as our new Green Deal boss in the European Commission. Uh, but of course, you've also done, have done a lot of work in interinstitutional relations and foresights. Please uh, come onto the stage. Some people have sometimes criticized me that I focus a lot on climate and I do not focus much on the social side of climate. Someone sitting in the front row has made that statement many times to me. But fortunately, in our political family, we have people like uh, Nicholas Smith, who never loses the social dimension uh, from his side. Please come to the stage, our commissioner. Um, please. Yeah, you want to sit here? No, no. OK. <laughs> no problem. Um, Happy to have you here. I'm going to have a sit. So let me start with Teresa, of course. I mean, we're in Malaga. And we know that Spain is one of the countries in Europe that's heavily affected by, let's say, climate change. And adaptation is not a plan B anymore. And we know that you've done a lot of work when it comes to climate adaptation during the last inter international climate negotiations at the COP27. And this is, of course, something that we want to continue on. Uh, but do you agree that we come to a point uh, in time where we cannot afford anymore to choose between climate mitigation and adaptation. What do you think would be the next crucial step, steps for climate adaptation in the EU and globally? Thank you, Mohamed. And allow me to go into a very broader perspective before coming to your Thank question. You. Because first, I come today from Brussels, 6 a.m. flight from Brussels to Malaga to celebrate something which, according to my own understanding, is a very important milestone. It's not anymore an issue of preserving or conserving nature. We need to restore. And if we want to be resilient to climate impacts, if we want to have an Europe which is climate neutral, if we want social justice, we need to restore our nature. And as Irace was saying, it is because we have counted on a very engaged 
political group in Europe working for this law, that today we are almost there, we are almost at the very end of this procedure. So thanks a lot to you all. My second comment, Nicolas is a champion in social issues, but you can count on people dealing with environmental issues having this social mindset, this social hurt when you talk to your family. So Maros is also a champion on social and climate issues, and I also try to bring this flag because it is very important. I think that yes, we cannot uh, deal anymore as if it were different issues reducing emissions and adapting to a different climate. Both things go along together. And uh, sometimes there are people that tend to say, the climate agenda is a threat. Sorry, what type of misperception is that one? What it is a real threat is not counting on a climate agenda. We need to ensure an effective and committed climate agenda to avoid finding ourselves again, paying honor, paying a contribute to those victims of climate change that pay with their lives what it means living in a different climate world. So I think that, yes, we need to invest in adaptation. And investing in adaptation is also trying to understand a little bit better what it means. It um, implies working at different levels of action, but I think that Europe can do it. Europe must do it. We have gone a longest way forward in these uh, last uh, years, and we need to keep on, keep on doing. So we have done a lot at the domestic level. This presidency is very committed. In, it is not the only one, but I think that uh, we will be in a position to say in very short uh, answer, yes, we need to do it. Yes, it is time to do it. Yes, we cannot avoid doing it. Yeah, there's always this false contradiction between being social on the one side and, and being pro-climate on the other side. I think when the, with the nature restoration law, it was severely attacked, stating that it's too much. Uh, people are saying that we are in favor of tackling climate change, but I think clearly said by you, we need restored ecological systems to make sure that climate change can be uh, addressed. Um, Maros, our new executive, first executive vice president responsible for the Green Deal. When it comes to adaptation, uh, when it comes to adaptation policies, what do you think could be the, let's say, the first steps we can take in Europe to make sure that that is back on the agenda? First and foremost, I really would like to thank and uh, congratulate uh, Teresa and Cesar for this uh, very arduous negotiations of yesterday, but more importantly for the successful conclusion, because you would remember, uh, Mohammed, before summer we've been not in such a high spirits that this actually could be done, so there was uh, a lot of uh, hard work done. I very much appreciate the close cooperation between Commission, the Presidency, and if you have such a committed President of the Council, like Teresa, <laughs> the, the, the things. Things, immediate, things immediately look brighter because uh, we are talking about very important piece of legislation, nat nature restoration law, but I would like to add uh, um, uh, also another uh, important element, and this is the hard work Teresa put uh, uh, into the new electricity market design, which is actually a very cryptic name for our policies to lower the prices of energy across the Europe and to bringing and accommodating more renewables in our system and that also happened under the leadership of Teresa and Spanish presidency and it's, and it's very, very crucial. So if it comes to the um, adaptation, um, you always have to look for the balance. Uh, where the adaptation starts and then when mitigation continues. And I think that we realized over the last uh, couple of years that they both have to go together. From one side, we have to adapt to, to the fact uh, that uh, uh, the, as we see every single summer, every single year that the temperature is rising. But at the same time, we have to do all we can in uh, mitigation efforts uh, to make sure that we would keep uh, uh, this uh, uh, global warming 
below 1.5 degrees Celsius because we see what is happening with the planet where we are still well below 1.5 and already how unbearable it is uh, uh, for the people in Europe but also across the world. I mean, we, and we are not only counting the, the damages in the billions, we are already uh, counting uh, the damages in the ultimate, uh, uh, ultimate uh, price which are human lives, which is human suffering and therefore I think it just show how important our efforts in, uh, in uh, these regards are. So if it comes uh, um, to, the, to the adaptation, I think we have to use all the opportunities which the science, uh, which the new technologies and which the, I would say, determination uh, of, the, of the policymakers are offering us. And therefore, I think uh, that the work uh, of the uh, socialists and democrats in the parliament, but also in the, in the member states, to highlight the importance of this effort is so crucial. And I think uh, working with the public opinion, uh, cultivating um, the support, uh, for the, for the Green Deal would be even more important in all these uh, pre-election debates, which on to these topics would be paradoxically very difficult. What I would like to thank the group for is that, uh, as you said, Mohammed, Mohammed uh, very rightly so, and I'm sure that Nicola would elaborate on this, that we always uh, highlight the fact that uh, we not only need the transition, but it has to be just, it has to be fair, it has to have a human element in it, and we always have to think about the most vulnerable uh, people because they are suffering the most also, if it comes to adaptation, mitigation, and very often they have to bring the, the biggest sacrifices. So I would say these are the key elements. Be fair, be just, be forward-looking, and be ambitious if it comes uh, to tackling the climate change. Thank you. Thank you, Maras. I think it's... I think you made a very good bridge for me also to go to, to Nicolas. I think um, uh, for our group, the just transition has always been at the core of climate change, and I can say that you were one of the people that make sh made sure that we kept that at the core of our, of our policy making. Um, when we talk about mitigation, there's usually a business case. There's usually money be to be made. Solar panel installation, windmills, etc. When it comes to adaptation, there's the price, I mean, there's no business case, but we're talking about making sure we don't have the damages, making sure people, vulnerable people, can continue living in the places where they live, that are directly affected by extreme weather. We've seen, for example, the floods uh, in, in, uh, in Greece, where a significant part of agricultural land was destroyed. So my question to you, how do you see the, this intersection? Um, how can we make sure that adaptation policies have positive effects uh, on, let's say, social aspects. Thank you very much. Um, very, uh, very happy to be here. And uh, I, I'm not only the champion of social, I want to be the champion of social and ecological uh, challenges. So. <laughs> but this is exactly the question. And this is the challenge also for us to explain that you cannot have a better society, a more just society, a fairer society, if we do not really, in a bold way, mitigate this climate threat which is destroying our societies, and uh, which risks, at the end, to uh, give just good opportunities to the most wealth or to the wealthiest, and those who are less wealthy, they will suffer the most from this climate catastrophe. So the challenge, the social challenge, and the climate challenge, they are absolutely interlinked. And that's why we have to make clear that uh, we as a movement, we have totally integrated the social dimension into the climate policy dimension. And no, the one does not go without the other. That's the first point. And this is a challenge because I, I, I am often in the European Parliament and I listen to the discourses, the speeches, especially from the extreme right, but sometimes also from other parts of this parliament, how they uh, finally fool people, saying that, well, climate policy, this is uh, not as serious as we pretend it to be, and it's a way to take people's money out of the pocket. And it's finally some kind of a so crazy socialist invention. This is the challenge for the next election, because this discourse we have to face. And it is about saving, saving the Green Deal, 
which means in a way saving the, work, the living conditions for the future of our planet and especially also of Europe, because Europe is not an exception. It has been said, I was very impressed by a movie I saw, I, I saw yesterday in another gathering, and when you see climate change, it's not tomorrow. Climate change is absolutely today. And uh, the catastrophes are taking place today, and they are just accelerating. So this is the first thing. Now, ca how can we do that? It's a question of money, obviously, absolutely. But it's also a question of how our economies and societies function. The transformation we are going for is a, the biggest transformation probably ever, because not only is it so big, it is very, very, in a very short time it has to take place. Because when we are talking about 2030 or 35 or 50, that's, that's very short. And we have to do that in a very short time. Now, the, the point is that obviously, this means for many people to accept changes. It's the change if, uh, in their private personal life. If you are, have to pay more for energy, this is the first point. We have really to pay attention to that. If you are encouraged to buy an electric car, this means have you the money to buy it when electric cars are much more expensive than others? So. These are the very practical issues we have to deal with people's concerns. And we can do it. That's a question of money, but it's also a question of organization. The second one is about business also, because people do not understand that we are supposed to get out of the fossil period. And when you look how the, bon benefit, uh, the profits of the uh, energy, big energy companies have been in the last years, well, this is astonishing because they never made as high profits than now. So they are the winners because it was, uh, we spoke about the winners of this. So we have to make sure that there is some equal and fairness in that. And that's why those who said, well, the super profits have to be taxed in a different way, this has to be done and this money has to be redistributed. <laughs> And my third point is obviously also about how we can accompany the transition. And I know Maus is doing a lot in a very positive and, and optimistic way. I, I read the new chief of the GIEC, he is a Scottish, I think. He said, well, I, I do not like to have this catastrophic only discourse. We have also to bring in a positive and optimistic discourse in that that there are a lot of good opportunities. But this is a question of policy making. The good opportunities only exist if you seize them, if you create the environment to make them real. And that's our job as social democrats, to show that we are ready to make these opportunities real. And this is about industry, this is about new jobs, this is about reskilling, this is about giving people the feeling that this huge change is not going at the expense of their basic security concerns in the job, in the income, in the way also for themselves and their, and their kids. So this means we have to accompany these changes, we have to accompany these transformations. And I think that we are there to make this new social ecological contract. Yes. This is the, the idea, we have to make the social ecological contract a reality. And show, I mean, I like, I really like your energy. Of course, the positive element and the positive change that could be created by adaptation and by climate policies, I think is a very important narrative for social democrats. Teresa, feel free to respond. Maros also. By the way, if you would like to address, a, to have, if you have a question, raise your hands. There will be people in the room walking around with microphones, and I'll give you the floor to ask a question to one of these uh, 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 panelists. So, in the meantime, Teresa, Teresa, please take the floor. Thank you, thank you. And I wanted not, not to respond, but to keep on building on what Nicolas has been uh, saying. Because in fact, from his comments, what we can read is that we all need to be champions. 
if our soul is to work and to provide possibilities and opportunities to citizens, we need to keep in mind this context, so to think in social and ecological terms to improve the way of life of people. And it is not only dealing with labor rights, of course, ecological legislation, of course, it's thinking about the urban agenda, it's thinking about access to fresh water, food security, biodiversity loss that we were talking yesterday in Brussels, health, housing, which is part of the urban agenda, industrial updates so that the goods that we produce are conceived in a way that uh, reduce our consumption, not only in the value chain, but also in their use in day to day. Reskilling, very important. This is also a very important divide where the skilled people may be, so to take full advantage of these opportunities. So education is also part of this transformation. This means that uh, it is not only thinking in terms of energy, of course, it is thinking in terms of where are the vulnerabilities, the physical vulnerabilities when floods take place, who counts on a good insurance system and who will be losing everything because the insurance industry is not accessible for many people, available for many people. What about access to fresh waters? Fresh water, sorry. So how it impacts in farmers or how it impacts in cities for consumers and households. Everything is going to be changing and we know enough to do a lot, but we still know not enough to be as effective as we need to be in this time frame. 10 years to transform almost everything. So we need to be quite committed and quite well organized with the principles very clear in our minds. This has a very relevant social impact. It irritates people, it fools people, because of course we are talking about the very basics for every single person. But at the same time, we need to seize these opportunities because the challenge is huge, but we should be working to ensure that the opportunities are available. And I think that uh, the fact that we were in a position to provide the input for the mandate of this European cycle was very important. To respond to crises that we had never imagined that we would be in a position to face. But this, how to say, challenges, not to call them crises, <laughs> may come back with different aspects in the time to be. So for the next cycle, we need to be investing right now on what we are going to propose, how the adaptation policy is being combined with the mitigation, but we do not talk so much about adaptation, and there is no single country, not even European countries, or Canada, or the United States, that can cope without a previous understanding on what it means and how we prepare ourselves to be ready to respond and how we reduce the risk to the type of wildfires we have been witnessing in Canada or in Hawaii, with the type of floods that we have been experiencing in Europe, Greece, with the type of droughts that we have been suffering for such a long time. So things that are becoming the new normal, that we need to anticipate and to prepare to be ready to respond, to reduce its impacts, but also to create new opportunities so that in this preparation, in this anticipation, there are good opportunities for jobs, and there is a, how to say, safer context for households and families. What about housing? Nicolas was saying, which is absolutely true. Extreme temperatures are not lived in the same manner when we count on a good isolated house than when it is not the case. Living near a flooding area that uh, used to flood every, I don't know, 100 years is not the same as living in a flooding area that becomes flooded every two years. And so on and so on, farmers. We have seen some of our political rivals trying to fool farmers. Sorry, if the soil is degraded, if the climate, if the climate becomes extreme, there is no farming production, there is death. 
So investing in water infrastructures in a different manner, investing in urban agenda in a different manner, investing in the financial business not to waste money, creating additional harm, but ensuring that the financial flows go there where we can create wealth, climate-proof wealth, and a basic fair access to prosperity is very important, the insurance industry. So probably we are those who have done much, we Europeans in the world, but there is a still a long way to go. And we have the means, the capacities, and the political commitment to do it, and we need to accelerate our action to be sure that we can deliver in due time. I think that uh, none of our children or grandchildren could uh, pardon us if we do not take the right answers today, which is not easy. We need to craft things and we need to explain things. I guess that what Nicola was saying, the main role that Maros has been working for a long time already, how we can be sure that people do understand why we do this in such an accelerated manner. It's not that we want to create burdens, it's that we want to ensure that we can benefit from wealth in the time to be. So how we can create these partnerships, how we can be humble and talking to the different partners to, to craft the best solutions is, is very important. The, the way we do things yes. will also matter. Not only the things we do, but the, day, the way we do things will also matter. Yeah. That's also matter. Very important. Um, <laughs> Very important point um, on when it comes to finance uh, and, and especially reallocating of the financial means. If I'm not mistaken, next week we also have an S&D event on sustainable finance. I'm going to advertise it a little bit here. Uh, so please uh, come and join to talk about that important topic next week. Maros, uh, please. Yep. I, I think that um, um, uh, Teresa and Nicolas kind of built very nicely the bridge to what I wanted to say because they, I think, described in very eloquent manner that anxiety uh, which was being built in our society over the last few years. And we have to be honest, uh, the, 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 the people in Europe went through a lot. I mean, we still remember uh, COVID, then the war in Ukraine, then uh, skyrocketing energy prices, uh, uh, inflation pressures, and now these terrible events which are unfolding in the, in the Middle East. So it's, it's just natural that that uh, after all these events, uh, there is uh, kind of anxiety in the society about uh, cost of living standards, about the, uh, the future job situation for our children, about the social cohesion. And, and here, I think uh, the work of the, of the uh, socialists and democrats would be so crucial because we are the natural partners to address these anxieties, to come up with the solutions, to propose the way forward. And therefore, the idea of uh, Nicolas, uh, of this new uh, social and ecological contract is so important because uh, the world has simply changed. And I'm very glad, Mohammed, that uh, you are addressing also the issue of uh, financing. And I think we need to find a way how to also address and put under certain pressure also financial industries because they also will have to change how they do the business. Simply, um, Teresa was referring to a very important issue of insurance. You know, you have a farmer who uh, started farming 20 years ago, uh, built a very nice farm close to the forest. And it was very good, very profitable operation. And, and now the insurance company will tell them, okay, we are not insuring you anymore because you are all under flood risk or under fire risk. This is simply not acceptable. Because again, it would be the, the most vulnerable people who would suffer from the fact that uh, the things like insurance will not be accessible to, to their to the, to the apartments or to their businesses. Second, I think, very important thing they will have also to kind of... Uh, realize the fact that we are in the 21st century economy. So it means that we will need totally different financial products than in the past. I think that if you are talking about electric vehicles or about the deployment of the new technologies like the, like the heat pumps, we have to make sure that uh, they will be affordable. And therefore, we probably will have to go through the new financing model, through this green leasing uh, system, through 
you know, monthly payment and not to kind of transfer the whole burden uh, on, on the citizens because they're kind of nervous about it. Can I afford it? How much would it cost? You know, maybe I will stay with the, with the you know, system I have here because, you know, I don't know uh, if I can afford it in the future. So we will need to develop also, I would say, the thinking along the line, how to really change also the, the structure of the financial industry to address, uh, I would say, these new uh, challenges uh, of, the, of the future. And I totally agree with, uh, with Nico as you know, I'm also responsible for the uh, common purchase uh, of gas, which was uh, the decision of the head of states and government and energy ministers as a reaction to the, to the last year drama. And when you see at the uh, look at the structure of profits uh, for how much you know the gas was bought in the US, for how much it was sold in Europe, that's simply unacceptable. I mean, we just have to bring more transparency. We need to work much more with the European common aggregation of our political weight, of our economic uh, strength, because we just simply have to use it much more assertively on, uh, on, on the global scale. And if you allow me the, the last... Uh, point upon which we've been also working very closely uh, with Teresa. These are the future oriented technology, for example, like the wind industry. We've been the pioneers. We brought this uh, uh, technology to the world, be it photovoltaic panels, be it uh, uh, wind industry. And then uh, because we, we are fair players, our industry is suffering. So therefore, I think we have to, again, bring new approach uh, uh, to public procurement, to the support uh, of our pioneering, uh, sustainable driven companies and, and look what we can do with uh, making sure that the price is not only criterion when it comes uh, to the public procurement, that we have to pay much more attention to the competitive sustainability, to the pre-qualification criteria, to make sure that uh, we would uh, prefer the companies which are responsible to the environment, which respect social standards, and which simply are doing business in how we Europeans want to live our lives. I think we, we have seen that uh, um, we put uh, this new approach on the table if it comes uh, in the last uh, wind energy package with the battery regulation. And I think, again, this would be something which uh, will have to be developed even further and uh, which would transform into the new uh, trade policy after uh, the European elections and when the next, the next commission would be in place. Because simply, we have to project um, our approach to economy also to the way how we will be trading with our partners and how we will be also ready to protect uh, the industry in Europe uh, when it's sustainable, when it's progressive, and when it's really using this new, new technology to, to save the planet. And the race is on. And the race is not about the, the economies of the past, but about the economies of the future. And this race would be very fierce, and we just have to be, we just have to be ready. And therefore, my last point would be, when you, when you look through different opinion polls that what the people in the elections are looking for in, in, in their leaders. And I discovered that one of the categories that people like the most are so-called happy warriors. And I think that if it comes uh, <laughs> to, the, to the tackling climate change, uh, our group, we have to be these happy warriors, to be clearly <clears throat> aware of the, of the challenges, of the problems, of the difficulties, but, but at the same time to be always ready to be optimistic and to come up with a positive, uh, 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 positive good solutions for our people that we know how to address the problem, we know how, uh, how to bring the solutions and we know how to bring new ideas to the table. Thank you, Mohamed. Thank you, Maros. Before I go to the, yes, yes. Before we go to the audience, I, Teresa, I still have a question for you. Next, uh, in a couple of weeks, you will lead the negotiations on behalf of the EU in the climate conference. And one of the elements that is, of course, the loss and damage framework around adaptation. Hopefully, you will succeed and finalize, I think, this very important topic. But if we would take that framework, do you believe that maybe we in the EU could maybe create a, like a similar framework within the EU on adaptation? where we cover maybe some of the risks, help vulnerable people, but also maybe uh, highlight some of the already existing instruments and create some uh, policy coherence there. I would really love to hear some uh, idea, oh, well, your comments on that. Thank you, thank you, Mohamed. And um, I think that, um, that yes, this is very important and challenging. 
Uh, something that we have not underlined enough is that it is not only that we are a little bit old-fashioned in some aspects and we need to update as we have been doing in many in many different policy frameworks, but it should also cover not only financial flows from private sector, but also taxing and fiscal policies. I think that we need to think in a different manner. But then the opportunity of the COP remind us that adaptation is a must. It's not just a local issue. It is a global issue with transboundary impacts. A through collective. Collective impact. No, but also transboundary. I mean, if there is a country with droughts, there may be problems on food production. There may be problems if it is a very poor society in terms of migration and poverty of families. So I think that um, we need this framework uh, happening at the domestic level, and we need the external dimension in our European policies, what, how we relate with our partners in third countries, and how we contribute to build a much more peaceful and secure world through the multilateralism. And this has a very important dimension when talking about adaptation and losses and damages. So, of course, the more we reduce emissions, the lower level of impacts we may be suffering, but even if we could go to zero emissions from now to two years, which is impossible, we could still be suffering the uh, um, inertia of the climate system, so there will uh, still be impacts that uh, may create much suffer, not only in Europe, but very much in particular in the most vulnerable countries in developing areas of the world. So we need to take this into consideration. Europe needs to be a committed partner, co-creating development, but co-creating resilience to climate impacts elsewhere. So yes, I think that we need to create a global framework for adaptation at the European level, but this European set of policies for domestic purpose should be completed with the external dimension being enhanced, <coughs> because we have learned a lot in the last years, but we need to be much more clear and much more committed in this external dimension on climate impacts elsewhere and how we can support many of our partners. I mean, I think a very important point that, of course, adaptation and loss and damage is not only something we do to help others, but at the end of the day, it's we are all connected. So create, solving a problem elsewhere is basically also solving our own problem. Uh, it's a very interesting point. Nicolas, please. Yeah. I just wanted to add one, uh, one uh, in my view, very central idea. I like the expression climate justice uh, 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 as much as just transition, but I think climate justice, because I think we have to show first that for the time being, climate is not just, because those who are suffering the most are the less wealthy. And uh, the point is also there is a danger that those who are the less wealthy pay the highest price in climate policies. This is something we have to be aware of. And what is the uh, strong demand of our citizens? The strong demand of our citizens is more fairness, more justice. They have the feeling that our societies have become more unfair or unfairer or un less just. And this is the response we have to give now. And I think that uh, when you look at uh, uh, who is polluting, who is, has the highest level of emissions, it's not the minimum wage earner. No. It's those who, uh, like us, I have to say it, who fly a lot, who have the biggest cars and so on, are not well. So, so this is something we really have to take into, uh, fully into account. And um, climate justice uh, means also, if we want that, that we cannot rely on markets only. Because markets, they have a role of allocation, but they are blind. And when you take, when, when, when we use markets at the end, well, it's clear that those who are the most vulnerable in society are the most affected. And therefore, we always need correction mechanism. Also with ETS. ETS is a good step, but ETS does not resolve the climate justice issue. So we have to have corrections. 
Now, I know, and you fought a lot for that, we have the Social Climate yes. Fund. Yes. Very good step. 76 billion, I think, yes. thanks to the parliament, by the way. <laughs> thanks to the parliament. Yeah, you yes, can. Yeah, definitely. Now I know, I know. That. <laughs> That's not enough. That's not enough. We have to do more because the impact is much higher. So I think this is the, the question to save the acceptability of all that. This is about climate justice. This is about how we can help those who are in two ways affected by the climate deterioration and by the uh, uh, mitigation. So we have really to deal with that. And this is the big part in our society. And this is also, it's just about climate. But at the end, it starts to become an issue for our democracy. Mm -hmm. This is the biggest and the most dangerous issue. When we listen to the extreme right, well, we see and we have to understand it has become an issue for our democracy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I, I mean, for me as social democrat, uh, I, I've observed that in the, in the past decades, we also have started to believe too much in the market, that the market will solve all of our problems. But in a transition, when there's a mismatch between supply and demand, where there's no market functioning, I think we have to reassess the position of governments. And only decoupling and de-risking, these two terms are quite fashionable these days, I think is not enough. I really believe we need to take the seat and you know, guide uh, uh, companies and society towards the end goal, and it has to be just or it will not exist. So I think let's, let's be, as, as, as governments, much more the co-investors sitting next to the markets and driving them exactly to the place where we want them to be, which is a climate-neutral society where vulnerable people have been helped and, and create better housing conditions, better jobs, for the next society, for the next generation. I'm sorry. Now I'm going to go to the floor. The first question, please stand up, tell us your name and the question, and of course, to who you're addressing the question. Yes, thank you so much. My name is Marene Elgeshuizen. I am in the past delegation of the Dutch uh, PVDA and Vice President of Rainbow Rose. And my question is to the panel. Um, I very much believe that climate justice is a very, very much a social democratic project, a lot. But I'm here from the Netherlands, so I'm going to ask a Dutch question. And in my country, the Greens are now very much cooperating with the social democrats, even uh, moving towards a very close alliance, and some might even say in uh, a merger. So what does the panel think about uh, forming a much, much closer alliance with the Greens in the European Parliament, or even might be a merger? Who wants to, who dares to answer this question? Uh, in, in the Parliament, we use, in the Parliament, I always joke with the Greens. I always say, like, you know, we need a progressive, uh, at least alliance against the extreme right, which is increasing, increasing, especially seeing the EPP aligning with them. And I always make this joke that we can simply rename our groups SDG, Socialists, Democrats, and Greens. And, uh, but uh, not everyone likes this joke, but, I, but please. <laughs> I, I, I would like to answer your question, changing the sense of the, the sense of the of direction. I think that we cannot call ourself, ourselves social democrats if we are not green, because of the reasons that Nicolas was explaining. <laughs> <laughs> and then there may be greens who partner with uh, the social democrats, and there may be greens that partner with liberals or with right wing because they think that the market, even being blind, can respond to the green demands, even if it is not sufficiently socially fair. It's not the most usual case, but it can be. So you can be green, rich, and being happy to be green and rich, but your social commitment is not so strong. So I think that, yes, we need to work with the greens. Normally, the larger of um, our green colleagues uh, go along the same lines that we are stating right now, but I, I don't think that uh, this is this is necessary. The the single 
the single response. I think that we need to be partners. I think that we need to to find all the all the possibilities to work together. But the main question could be to ourselves: We need to be greens, to be social democrats. That that. I, I like. I really like this answer. Although you know, I'm Dutch, and uh, thank you for asking a very difficult question for me uh, as being Dutch. But I mean, the the the, the answer of you, Teresa, social democracy. You cannot be social democrats without being green. I think this is something I really, I really want to underline. You know, our social policies always come, uh, I think, with a green uh, uh, core. Uh, so thank you for that answer. Maybe one of you would like to uh, uh, touch this question. Yeah, I, I think that um, there is always very close uh, cooperation and collaboration between Greens and and, and social democrats, and I think. Uh, each of these parties are bringing something um, um, uh, to the table. The, the, um, uh, we know very well how our uh, green colleagues are approaching different different files uh, and um, different solutions. And what I think is very important uh, on the tackling the, the challenges linked uh, with uh, the transition is that social democrats are always bringing into the forefront the social dimension of the transition, because. Some of the solutions uh, uh, could go further, could go faster, but at the same time, we have to make sure that they are socially acceptable, that, uh, that they are socially fair, that, uh, um, that we can, let's say, offset uh, by uh, social measures the, the, the possible um, uh, problems linked with the introduction um, of uh, some of these measures, that uh, we would kind of uh, phase in the pace uh, which would help us to preserve and develop further the social co uh, um, uh, cohesion and, um, and, and social uh, contract, as uh, Nicholas has described. So, so I think that the uh, cooperation is there, but I very much appreciate uh, that the socialists and, and democrats are focusing also on how to do the right thing, how to do the best possible solution if it comes to the, uh, to the uh, green uh, transition agenda, but at the same time not to lose the sight uh, of the fact that it has to be socially fair, it has to be socially just, uh, and, uh, and uh, that you have to think about the most vulnerable people who very often are also faced with the biggest challenges how to adapt uh, to the new system. So I think that uh, uh, this collaboration is good, it will work for the future, but I think uh, that each of us are bringing to the table something special, and that's, uh, I, I would say, to the, to the benefit of the democratic discussions in Europe and, of course, in the European Parliament. I don't know, Nicolas, if you look, would like to... He, he, Nicolas agrees. So we agree on the goal, but we sometimes disagree on the pace and the inclusion, of course, of everyone, because we always say we want to leave no one behind. I go to the next question from the audience. Please state your name and the question. This is former commissioner for health and food safety. But I, my question is, now I see two strong pillars, social and ecological and transition. What do you think of the possibilities to include a health pillar and to speak about togetherness, social, health, and ecological transition? Because we need to see such triangle. Because we know very well what, uh, how uh, damages create uh, air pollution and so on to, 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 to people's health directly, keeping about premature death and so on. The figures shows whether we need to see those three pillars when we are speaking about more coherent, more socially, more green, and more healthy social democracy. Thank you. Nicolas, would you want to respond? I think that that's absolutely true. I, health policies, we have experienced it through the uh, COVID, how important it is to have uh, a European really? health policy. And uh, we finally build one uh, by necessity due to the uh, pandemic. But uh, uh, climate change is uh, really also impacting the situation of health dramatically, dramatically. And especially for, again, for the most vulnerable for the workers in agriculture, in construction. Therefore, we have now taken special uh, provisions to protect these workers. So I think when we are talking about, when I talk about this social, ecological, that means that 
obviously in social we have to have a very good and more uh, more also more just health policy because health has suffered also from uh, cuts from budgetary cuts in the past and we have seen uh, if uh, our health systems are not resilient, are not well equipped, well, we cannot face the big challenges uh, like a pandemic or other uh, health challenges. And I think this is absolutely part of, uh, has to be part of our social, uh, our social um, program, uh, that uh, we, we, we want to have a, a better uh, health policy, more equal, equal access or better access. That's, by the way, I have to mention it because otherwise uh, people think that I've forgotten it. It's uh, one of the principles of our social pillar. That's important and that's why we have to work on that also and continue working on this health policy. So I fully agree. And this means perhaps if there is one day a treaty revision, we have to revamp the, the article on health. And include health, definitely. Yes, if you have a question, raise your hand so that the people with the microphone see you. Please. Thank you for an interesting discussion. My name is Arian. I'm from the Swedish Social Democratic Youth League. I wanted to say that if you politicians would have listened to us youths 20 years ago, you would have not been in this situation today. So my question is, what are you going to do to not repeat the same mistake? Thank you. A very hard question, very hard question. 20 years ago, I considered myself young, so <laughs> let's see what the others uh, would reply on that. No, <laughs> Teresa. Very similarly, 20 years ago, I was saying these things, and today I'm, I'm trying to pave the way to avoid exactly. people feeling the fear and feeling the anger of not counting on responses. I think that the anger of the youth is um, justified, and I think that it has taken too long, and Irache's comments were very clear. I mean, when we read the final declaration of the Estocolm Conference in 1972, we break in tears. Because in fact, the messages were so clear, and it has taken so long that now we only have, what, 10, ten years. Yep. This intensity in the transformation is... Um, it's difficult. We need to be very, 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 uh, how to say, empathetic and capable to, to, to convince people that um, institutions deserve trust and institutions need to be sufficiently committed and quick to make this happen in a fair and a just manner because we run out of time. And it's not just denouncing all the things that do not work. The difficulty is how we go beyond that so to identify solutions, opportunities, seizing these things that need to, cha to change, because otherwise it's uh, quite frustrating. So, youth is very, very important to keep the pressure on those that uh, still think, well, maybe it's not the right moment, we can delay a little bit, we need uh, a break in regulation or in changes in policies. Sorry, there are things that do not wait. And Beautifully, the laws of the physics <coughs> and the nature do not wait. Do not wait for the right moment to introduce the changes that we need. So I was being an activist, young activist, claiming um, for justice. So I think that, yes, we need not to waste more time. And I love the consistency of your question. I remember you asked the same question during the Yes conference, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> uh, so very good, very good. And Maybe I if you if you allow me, yes, Mohammed, just just one 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 reaction <laughs> because I, I I think that the role of uh, young people and youth uh, in the uh, current debate is absolutely important because uh, here I mean we we all are convinced uh, we believe the science we look at the weather forecast we are watching the news and I don't think that anyone in this room need convincing that climate change is happening that uh, the, the warming of the planet is accelerating and that it has absolutely devastating impact and consequences on, on the life of people living in Europe and everywhere in the world. But you know very well that this is not the case in all corners of Europe, in all corners of the world. 
if you if you look at uh, some of the, some uh, countries close to Europe, across one little channel or across the Atlantic. So we see that the debate there is extremely polarized and that actually uh, this, uh, I would say, scientific truth is heavily, heavily contested. And I think Nicola was very rightly describing the, uh, the course with which uh, especially the extreme right will take uh, uh, um, to, the, to the election. So we need young people uh, to keep this permanently on the radar screen, to help us to communicate on this issue, to use your super skills with social media, with uh, all the uh, ability uh, uh, to present it in, in very clear case uh, to the older uh, generation, to bring this youth positive uh, energy that we have a problem but we are also ready to solve it and we support uh, this positive change because uh, we are doing our best, I believe, uh, with Teresa. We've been always 20 years uh, <coughs> ago young, but I think that the decisions <laughs> what we are taking right now will, will definitely be, be, be affecting especially your, your, your generation. So we need your energy, we need your support, you, we need your ability to communicate through all the platforms because this is not uh, uh, the battle which is already won because you see that there is still a lot of climate uh, skeptics on all levels uh, in, in the political uh, circles everywhere in the world, including in Europe. And I think that this would be one of the uh, battle lines uh, in the next uh, also European uh, elections. Uh, who would be elected, on what platform, and how we would address the issue of the climate change. And I'm sure there will be a lot of a lot of resistance and fake truth and fake arguments brought into this debate, and therefore the role of uh, young people in, uh, in mobilizing, I would say, the opinion and support uh, for the policies which are tackling climate change and support the just uh, transition would be so important. Thank you, Maros. Thank you, Maros. We still have time for a couple of questions. Josias? Thank you. My name is Joao Solok, as a member of uh, SND Group from Lithuania. I fully agree with what you said about the, the situation and the, the, our uh, efforts for, to increase the, the social and uh, environmental or ecological contract. I fully agree with my friend Vitanis Andriuk, the health also should be included loudly, because in, in different pool opinions, the health is in very high position. But I have a question about two positions. Uh, regarding the election, we should convince the, our citizens to support us, to create more supporters for that. And this is very uh, thin uh, question because the populist or right wing is fighting against all this uh, possible negative aspects for, for someone of, in this stage. And you, Nicola, mentioned this differences and they were increasing the profit for the uh, international big companies in this very difficult situation. I think we need to found the instrument how we can uh, prepare the new taxes or, 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 or new tools to have the more possibilities to, to support our, our citizens, not showing this disproportion between the huge companies and ordinary our citizens. And the second one, more responsibility on the Commission, on European Union level. Because it's very difficult to convince each member state to implement this, not having the stronger input from, from uh, European Union uh, institutions. Thank you very much. I want to take as much questions as possible, but uh, can, we, can we do, no, let's just do a quick answer and then go to another question, answer, question, answer, uh, so that as much people can, can get uh, the, the opportunity to ask a question. Who wants to reply on this briefly? I, I fully agree because at the end it's a question who will pay for it and uh, so uh, we cannot have the biggest possible transformation and everything uh, uh, remains the same. So I think we have to adjust also our taxation systems and, uh, pay and, and make those pay who for the time being do not really pay what they should. So when we are discussing about, by the way, why not this financial transaction tax? was already on the table of the uh, union and then was taken away. These are billions of euros we could mobilize to invest, but also to guarantee a more climate, more climate justice. So taxation is a core issue in that, clear. But we know it's not easy to decide on this. Mm -hmm. I, I will not go further. 
So this is, uh, this is absolutely true. Thank you. Then, then we go to the question, Mr. in the back. Sir in the back. Hola, Please. buenos días a todos. Uh, soy Good morning, everyone. I'm Yine Aldipo. I'm Secretary General from the Paris Vesoy office. English. So I have uh, two questions. I think the ecological transition is something very important. And uh, we need really all the European citizens to understand uh, how it's important uh, the transition uh, project uh, in their daily life. And my question is, if it is possible to create a special fund in order to support you know, uh, the electric uh, cars area, in order to decrease the price, because people need cars in European country, in all the countries in the world, to work for their daily life. And we have seen now in any, uh, in a, Every city, most of cities in European uh, countries, uh, they are prohibited cars. And uh, I think uh, maybe uh, SND can uh, make uh, some proposal in order to create a special fund, you know, to decrease the price of, of electric cars. I think that can be a real good project, which can be understood by all the cities in Europe. In Europe. I think and the question. second question is about uh, the creation of the international fund to support all the transition uh, projects through the world. And uh, I would like to know how we can increase that fund because it is not really enough to, to challenge uh, all of the transition projects in the world. So, in the European level, how we can do to okay. increase that fund? Clear. Thank I think you very the much. The first question is about. Uh, access to, to transport. Maybe that's a good question for you, Amaros. And the second part on international climate finance, maybe, uh, Teresa, you could uh, elaborate on that. Maros, on... Uh... Yeah, I, I would say that uh, the response should be structured along different lines. The first and foremost, of course, what I think it's uh, uh, very much in the DNA of uh, socialism and democrat uh, is that we should uh, develop as much as possibility uh, affordable uh, public transportation to to use uh, the the biking path to simply uh, create uh, the the solutions also in the urban and suburban area where you can ac actually really uh, minimize the the need uh, for the p uh, personalized transport but i agree with you that you have the areas and you have the situations where you simply would need the car and i understand uh, the worries that the electric vehicles at this stage are more expensive than uh, than uh, combustion engines and what would it mean in, uh, in uh, the future. Of course, they, as you know, there are the schemes uh, which are run by uh, different member states with uh, the different type of, I would say, also uh, support uh, for the purchase of uh, electric vehicles, but I think that uh, we would need a little bit more systemic solution for that, and I would recall again what I said at the beginning of my remarks. We just simply need uh, uh, the green financial engineering in this regard. We need a new type of uh, leasing mechanisms which would make also electric vehicles, heat pumps and all the other um, uh, uh, technological solutions more affordable uh, for, the, for the people. We need to find new possibilities for blending uh, public and private funds uh, which uh, simply would uh, make uh, this transition affordable and, and socially just uh, for our citizens. So this, I would say, would be the one answer. And second one, I think that it was uh, answered very, very nicely before, but if we are looking, for example, for the financial instrument like Social Climate Fund, what I think should be very important, and I think it, it would be a very good task uh, for socialists and Democrats to make sure that, that this time this fund would really be used not as a, I would say, automatic income for the treasuries in our member states, but uh, that the sums which will be there would really be allocated for addressing the difficult situation of the most vulnerable people across the Europe. Mm -hmm. that this fund is there for them. It's just not for beefing up the, let's say, public uh, uh, financing situation, but it's a fund which is coming from Europe to the most vulnerable people across the Europe to address the cost of the transition. So there have been few uh, ideas uh, to the question of the gentleman there. Thank you. Would you like to maybe say something on the second part of the question? Um, yes, on, on the second part of the question, I would like to remind us that um, 
Europe is the part of the world that has contributed the most to the international climate finance mechanism and the um, climate proof uh, development understanding in other countries. Um, and uh, I think that we need to, to, to keep it strong uh, and to keep committed along these lines. But um, there is also something which is very important, which is that uh, it, it is not going to work if we only think in terms of how much we transfer from a public budget from an European member state towards somewhere else. That's not going to be enough because the cost, the United Nations report on the adaptation gap says that we could be needing three billion, $300 billion per year to cope with the adaptation requirements and the loss and damage all over the world. So we, we need to reorientate all the financial flows. And we need to open a very complicated debate. And in the mandate for the negotiation for the COP, we have got this for this year, which is, please, let's think in different terms. How we can create something that reflects today capacity connected to the polluter pays principle. Why would we not invite to fossil fuel companies to invest in a different type of development in third countries? They are going to say no for the time being, but let's see. How we introduce this reference to maritime transform transportation or to aviation uh, so that it reflects a different uh, um, update uh, in today's um, travels. Today's travels is not just Western citizens traveling and the rest do not travel, or a, a merchandise coming from a Western countries to Western countries. It has a different mapping behind that should be helping that countries and companies producing fuels, fossil fuels, do contribute to the cost, but uh, certain services and activities that we also demand, mm. but not we are not the only ones that do demand this type of goods, do also contribute to a different type of development. So keeping this understanding of ensuring that all financial flows are climate proof uh, in an increased manner. And I have a second comment to your first question and to your second question, but also thinking on the previous questions. I think that, yes, we need to work on what we offer to citizens. And this is very important in this meeting, thinking towards the campaign and so on. And I said before, we need to be green. It's not that the Greens need to be social democrats, that's fantastic, but we need to be green. But we need to be young. We need to think with a forward-looking approach on what type of challenges and problems we need to respond. So, of course, we need to create this flexibility, this positive mm. environment, this willingness to do more, mm -hmm. but we also need to provide proposals mm. that have a refreshed understanding on the problems and the, and the answers. And I think that uh, this is something that uh, we still need to invest much more in our own, in our own groups. Perfect. I'm going to take the last two questions very briefly. Only two questions. Please, you and the sir at the back, and then I'm going to wrap up. I actually got uh, half of my questions answered. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm from Kurdistan of Iraq, and my question was that some countries still in the world, their economy completely depends on fossil fuel. And because of that, we, we still have a hard time, you know, moving away from that. It will break our economy down, for example how flexible these acts are, how uh, inclusive these green acts are to include, uh, to include these third world countries without breaking down their economies. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. climate is not exclusive to just Europe or America or part of the yes. world. It affects everyone. If we're still polluting the climate, no matter what you do, it's not going to be enough. Basically, we're do doing un undoing all your efforts. So how much effort is being put into that initiative? Yes. And um, how much have you thought of putting consequences on those countries in terms of sanctions and things like that? Thank you. Clear. Second question, I'm, I'm going to wrap, please. Je m'appelle Gafar Darawan. Je suis... Gafar Darawan. I represent the Kurdistan government in Spain and Portugal. Tarina was my colleague who spoke earlier. I have a question. What can we do in the Middle East with regard to 
climate change, especially in Kurdistan and Iraq, where we have uh, an oil producing region, an area that produces gas and oil. So how can we face climate change in that region? Especially in a city, if you look at Salmani, where there's a lot of oil and gas reserves, what can we do there to combat climate change? Mentioning English, so that saves us a bit of time. Who would like to respond on this question? Uh, Teresa, please. Let's, we have to wrap up, so let's be... Uh, Easy, yes, easier to be said than to be made, but important to be made, because otherwise it's a kind of damn uh, um, conclusion on your own country and society. I think that it is important to diversify the, uh, the way you create wealth and prosperity uh, and to do it in a very quick manner. Not because uh, we are thinking on a, uh, what could be the penalty that someone else is going to impose of, of us, but because it's, it is a vulnerability. You cannot rely on something that sooner than or later is going to be out of the market for several reasons. So I think that it is very important creating the opportunities to, to have other, other ways to achieve uh, prosperity and wealth in the, um, in the society. And I think that, again, here there is a kind of social trap because at the end, if um, this is something that requires different skilling for youth, different prices for energy, uh, it's difficult to be organized in such a way that does not create a higher divide uh, in social terms. So I think that it, it requires a quite committed ex um, execution of the uh, public policies to facilitate this transformation. And I think that uh, we, can, we can see the difficulties of countries that uh, are producers and quite wealthy, and they, they, uh, they try to, to, to get as much time as possible to make this conversion happen. And, uh, and it is always, the inertia also plays a role here, or if it is working, how we are going to make a change on this. But it is much more difficult in countries where uh, this wealth is not so high. So in fact, you have something that it is very well sold. You don't have so many opportunities to build a different type of uh, development and wealth in your country. And, um, and there is not such an easy way to convince others to, to make this, uh, this happen. But I guess that uh, the, the best way to do this is to build partners. Now we will have a similar conversation with other type of uh, raw materials that could be required in the new energy and digital uh, industrial uh, um, value chains. And I think that we need to think uh, to make things differently. We need to build co-development, co-partnership, and to ensure that the add value, we are very efficient in the use of these materials, but that the add value is uh, being reinvested to create other type of, um, of um, opportunities and not higher dependencies on new sources of, um, of uh, richness. How, I don't know how to say it. Thank you very much. I have to close this workshop. I'm going to tell you, as a uh, vice president of S&D Group, you can count on us that we will start working on a European framework on adaptation, showing solidarity between member states and prioritizing vulnerable citizens and regions. You can count on us for that. Let me thank our esteemed panel, Nicola Schmidt, Teresa Ribera, and Maro Safkovic. And I would say, have a good lunch. <laughs>